Hey guys, I'm Saurav. Welcome to the channel. I hope you people are doing good. It's so good to see you people again. I'm back in Montreal. I came back from a trip to India where I went for a wildlife photography trip to Tadoba National Park. It was an amazing experience and we were very lucky to spot a lot of different species. In this video, I'm going to share everything, literally everything that I have learned over the past few years when it comes to wildlife photography. Three, four years ago, when I first got introduced to wildlife photography, I had a lot of questions. What camera and lens combination is the best? What setting should I use? How should I compose my images? How do I focus on the subject? You don't have to be confused. You don't have to worry because that's what I'm going to talk about in this video. This is going to be a super helpful and informative one. So without wasting any time, Let's get started. First, let's talk about camera gear. When it comes to cameras, I'm going to talk about cameras that specifically supports multiple lenses. When it comes to wildlife photography, lenses matter more than the camera body, but we'll get back to that later. Crop sensor, micro four thirds and full frame cameras are the options to choose from. These cameras have different sensor sizes. A full frame camera usually is preferred to be a better option since it has a larger sensor resulting into a better low light performance. But when it comes to wildlife photography, there is a very special advantage to crop sensor cameras. Since a crop sensor camera has a smaller field of view, technically you're getting more reach from the exact same lens, which is super helpful because most of the times in wildlife photography, the subject is going to be at a distance and this will help you get closer. But when it comes to choosing cameras, there's more to it than just sensor sizes. One of the most important things to consider while choosing a right camera is the speed of the camera. Meaning how many frames per second can the camera capture? Higher the number, lesser are the chances of missing the action. Another factor to consider is the buffer size. Let me quickly explain what buffer size is. When you capture images, the images are stored in memory card, right? But this is not a direct process. It's an indirect process, meaning when you capture the images, the images are first stored in the internal memory of the camera. And then these images are transferred to the memory card. This internal memory is known as the buffer. Once the images are successfully transferred to the memory card, the buffer is then cleared again to store new photos. Now, why does this matter? Imagine there are two cameras, A and B. Both can shoot 10 frames per second. The difference being camera A's buffer size is 10 images, camera B buffer size is 20 images. A will get filled within one second and will eventually slow down. Camera B will get filled in two seconds and then it will slow down. Camera B shoots 20 images at full speed, camera A shoots 10 images at full speed. This might seem like a small thing, but it plays a huge role when you're shooting fast paced action. A crucial tip to avoid filling the buffer quickly is to choose the right file type. Smaller the file size, it will take longer to fill the buffer. Personally, I shoot everything in RAW and I would recommend you to do the same. However, do not shoot in RAW plus JPEG. Because when you shoot in RAW plus JPEG, you're storing two different copies, a RAW and a JPEG of the same image. You're taking more space and the buffer will get filled quickly. JPEGs are smaller than RAW files and will provide a slight advantage when it comes to the buffer size, but the flexibility that the RAW files give is worth sacrificing that extra speed. One last thing about cameras, which is not super important, but still plays a role when it comes to wildlife photography is megapixels. Higher megapixels is not always considered better, but it comes in handy when you have to crop the image. The extra resolution gives you more flexibility to adjust the framing. Enough about cameras, let's talk about lenses. Usually for wildlife photography, you're looking for a lens with a longer reach, something between 300 to 600 millimeters. If you're getting started and you want to buy a lens, I would recommend to get a zoom lens, meaning you can change the focal length. If the lens you want to buy is expensive, I would highly recommend to rent it out for a few days, try it out and then make a decision. Along with the focal length, also pay close attention to the aperture. If the aperture is too small, you won't get that shallow depth of field and more importantly, it won't perform well in low light. For example, Canon has a 800mm f11 and it's not very expensive. Considering the price, 800mm seems very tempting, but f11 is a very small aperture and something I would not recommend. 
try to stick to a range between f4 and f6.3 when it comes to zoom lenses. Prime lenses on the other hand, especially telephoto prime lenses have wider aperture. Like for example, 400mm 2.8, 600mm f4. They are not versatile enough as the zoom lenses, but the advantage is amazing image quality. The sharpness, the colors, the shallow depth of field is unmatched. The only problem is the lenses are crazy expensive. If you have that kind of money to spend on the lenses, I would recommend buy two of them and please gift me one. Jokes apart, I always say this in a lot of my videos, there is not one particular lens made for a particular genre of photography. And it's true for wildlife photography as well. A lot of wildlife photographers prefer carrying two different camera bodies and attaching two different lenses on it. For example, one would have something like a 200-500 or a prime telephoto and the other would be a 70-200 or 24-70. The reason for that is wildlife photography is not always about capturing the tighter compositions. Sometimes you also have to show the subjects in their natural habitat and wide angle lenses are the perfect option to do that. I'll get back to composition at the later part of the video. Now let's talk about camera settings. Most important camera setting that you have to get right is choosing the right focusing mode. Ideally, you would want to choose a focusing mode that supports some kind of subject tracking. The exact autofocus mode will vary from camera to camera, but the idea is to choose a continuous autofocus option, which will maintain focus on the subject till you have half pressed the shutter button. A lot of recent mirrorless cameras have an option of animal subject detection, which does a great job in detecting the faces and eyes of the animals. Talking about camera modes, no brainer, always use manual mode. Reason being, you need complete control over your aperture and shutter speed. Your aperture will decide the depth of field and your shutter speed will decide the motion blur in the image. How fast the shutter speed should be depends on the speed of the subject. If the subject is moving slowly, I would start shooting somewhere around 1 500th or 1000th of a second. Faster the motion of the subject, faster should be the shutter speed in order to get a sharp image. Even if the subject is not moving, I would still prefer to use a fairly faster shutter speed because when you're shooting at longer focal lengths, you would get shake if you're shooting somewhere around 1 50th or 100th of a second. Take it with a grain of salt, the shutter speed should be at least twice the focal length. Meaning, if you're using a 400mm lens, stick to somewhere around 1 800th of a second or faster. Let's talk about composition. Number one mistake I did as a beginner is exactly what I said a few minutes ago. And a lot of beginners do this, considering subject as the only important part of the image. The subject might be the most important part of the image, but that is not the only part of the image that you should focus on. Let me explain. Now this image is a fairly tighter composition, which is great. It helps you to only focus on the subject and can be a very good option for animal portraits. The mistake would be to only consider tighter compositions while photographing wildlife. Wider compositions allow you to have a bit of breathing space and can be helpful to give a sense of surrounding. You can frame the subjects along with its natural habitat. Now this image is shot at f2.8 so that I get a shallower depth of field and good background separation. To get shallower depth of field, there are a couple of more things you can do apart from using a wider aperture. The first one is shooting at a lower angle. The lower you go, ideally shooting from a ground level, the distance of the subject and the background increases, which increases the background blur. Number two, avoid cluttered background. If the background is cluttered, even if you're shooting at 2.8, you won't get good background separation. One hack that I always use when I'm recording videos with a full frame camera and I want to get closer is recording the video in crop mode. Now every camera might not have this feature and obviously I'm only talking about full frame bodies. Instead of shooting a wider 4K video and then zooming in, which will result into loss of resolution, I can shoot a 4K video in crop mode. The benefit is even if I've cropped in, the resolution still stays the same. When it comes to capturing photos, 
crop mode doesn't give you a different advantage is same as cropping the wider original image in post but a lot of times wildlife photography competitions will only allow you to crop 10-20% of the images. At such times if you are using a crop mode your image is already cropped and you don't have to crop a lot in post. Next let's talk about editing. Editing in my experience is very important in wildlife photography. The major reason being the light is not under your control in wildlife photography. Most of the times you're shooting in natural light. I'm not going to cover the entire editing process. If you need an in-depth video, let me know in the comments below. I will share two editing techniques that I use for most of my wildlife images. First is masking. With the select subject feature in Lightroom, it has become super easy. What I like to do is select the subject and increase the sharpness, the texture, clarity. But at the same time, I can invert the subject selection, select the background and reduce the light, reduce the highlights and make the lights a bit less harsh. I'm basically trying to increase the subject and background separation by doing this. Another thing which I like to do, not for all the images, for some of them, is to add a soft glow. How to do it? Use a radial filter and select from where do you want the glow to come from. Normally, I would choose a place from where the light is coming from so that it feels more natural. Then increase the exposure a bit. Now you have a basic glow added. Here onwards, you can tweak the whites, the blacks, make it even more natural. Make sure don't overdo it. You can slightly even make it warmer in case you want to mimic sunlight. One mistake, I'm not sure if you have did it, but I sure did, is reviewing the images when the subject is in front of you. Never do this. Whenever the subject is in front of you, you have to be ready with your camera. You have to pay close attention to what the subject is doing. Any kind of movement, any kind of activity, you have to be ready to shoot it. Fraction of a second of a delay and you might miss the shot. Reviewing the images is necessary. Maybe you're using a wrong camera mode, maybe the wrong autofocus mode. Reviewing the images will help you prevent making the same mistake for the other images, but make sure to only do it when the subject is not in front of you and you're not shooting. Talking about capturing the moment, it is very important to remain quiet and calm when the subject appears in front of you. Do not make any kind of noise and let the subject get comfortable. My camera has the option to turn off the shutter sound. I even do that in order to not distract the subjects. Couple of reasons for doing that. You should respect wildlife. Yes, getting a shot is important, no doubt. But what's more important? Respecting them and their privacy. Second reason, the more the subject gets comfortable, higher are the chances you would be able to see a natural moment and capture it. Yes, it can be very exciting when you see a tiger, a leopard or a lion in front of you, but make sure to be quiet and calm, respect them and focus on getting the shot. Last tip for today, you might not agree on this, is enjoying the moment and not capturing photos all the time. As a photographer, one of the regrets I have is always looking for the perfect shot and not enjoying the moment. I remember there was this one time the tiger was staring right at me. I took one shot and I kept my camera down. I was a bit scared, not gonna lie, but I can't forget that moment. That moment was very special. Had I only focused on getting the shot, I would not have experienced it. One of the things that I want to end this video is the experiences are as important as the photos you capture. Please enjoy them. That's it from this video, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope this video was helpful. And if it was, make sure you press the like button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you have not already. And make sure we reach 1 million as soon as possible. I will talk to you guys in the next one. Bye.